Tonight, new charges against a Canadian man already accused of selling a deadly substance to people around the world. The latest allegations connected to 12 more deaths in Ontario. Every individual death is a, is a tragedy. After police say more than a thousand packages were sent to 40 countries. We are cooperating and sharing information with law enforcement on a global scale. Smearing a famous Canadian piece of art. What's worth more, a painting of landscapes or the real landscape? A protester calls for climate action, but his method is called out. Plus, a historic day in women's hockey. Many women before me have dreamed of something like this. The world's best about to hit the ice in three Canadian cities. Amazing what happens when you dream. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Vashi Capellos. Good evening. A Canadian man accused of preying on people in need of support and care faces new charges in this country tonight. Police have linked Kenneth Law to 12 more deaths in Ontario. He now faces 14 counts in total for allegedly helping people take their own lives. CTV's Heather Wright on the new developments in a growing investigation with a now global reach. I'm Ken, yeah. Yeah, I'm the former chef accused of selling sodium nitrite to vulnerable people around the world is now facing more charges. The police have laid an additional 12 charges of counseling or aiding suicide. Police accuse Kenneth Law of running at least five websites used to sell sodium nitrite. Typically used as a curing salt, it can be deadly in high doses. Police say Law also sold hoods and masks, shipping more than 1,200 packages in a two-year period. The victims uh, were Ontario residents. They were both male and female. Uh, between the ages of 16 and 36 years of age. The 57-year-old now faces a total of 14 charges, all related to deaths in Ontario, but he is linked to many more. This is the guitar that Jaden played the most. 21-year-old Jaden was from Langley, B.C. and took his life two and a half years ago. His mother says her son had been communicating with Kenneth Law online, but so far there's been no investigation into his death. All of the attention is with the, from the Peel police to um, residents of Ontario. What about the rest of the country? Police believe law shipped at least 160 packages to addresses in Canada, while in the UK, authorities have identified at least 272 people as having purchased products from his websites. 88 of them have died, people are gonna be like, what including Tom Parfit, who took his life when he was just 22 years old. Every individual death is a, is a tragedy and, and the numbers we're seeing here just defy belief. While restricting access to sodium nitrite is one solution, Tom's father David wants the online forums his son used to find the poison shut down as well. I still don't understand why we allow people access to a forum that encourages vulnerable people like my son to understand how to kill themselves and then provides the methods to do so. Police believe law sent packages to at least 40 countries but won't say how many deaths might be linked to him. Based on an analysis by CTV News though, that number could be more than 110. Vashi. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, Northern Saskatchewan First Nation is revealing a traumatic discovery, more potential unmarked graves at the site of a former residential school. Initially believed to be 83 possible sites, that number has grown. There are 93 unmarked graves, 79 children and 14 infants. This is not a final number. English River First Nation made the discovery after a two-year search at Beauval Indian Residential School using a combination of ground-penetrating radar, geoscience and archaeological expertise. Turning south of the border, a race against time. Hurricane Idalia is growing stronger by the hour as it moves towards Florida. The major storm will crash into the coast tomorrow, but is already creating havoc. Gusty winds and water flooding the streets, as you can see there in some parts. All part of a storm surge the state is bracing for. CTV's Heather Butts now tracking its path tonight. 
Hitting Cuba this morning, Idalia brought fierce winds and heavy rains, flooding homes and streets, forcing people in coastal communities to flee. The rapidly intensifying storm captured from space, Idalia is barreling towards Florida's Gulf Coast, expected to slam ashore as a Category 3 hurricane Wednesday morning. It's that if this storm hits at high tide, storm surge could reach 8 to 12 feet in some areas. You run from the water and you hide from the wind. Uh, if you're there in that storm surge, uh, you're putting your life uh, in jeopardy. The first major hurricane set to make landfall in the U.S. this year. Officials have ordered evacuations and urged millions to brace for impact. The significant risk and the, the, the highest risk for uh, loss of life is storm surge. And that storm surge right now shows impacts all along the western coast. The storm's outer bands already impacting parts of Florida, devastated by Hurricane Ian less than a year ago. Murky brown water flooding the street as people attempted to leave Fort Myers Beach. The U.S. Coast Guard preparing helicopters needed for any possible search and rescue operation. An aqua wall has been installed around this Tampa hospital, while others turn to sandbags. It's going to be bad. And I'm kind of scared because I live in apartments. And when it rains, water come up on my porch. Hundreds of kilometers of Florida shoreline are under storm surge warnings. If we get 8, 10, 12 foot surge, you're talking water's going to just flood all of these buildings. In Cedar Key, state troopers were seen knocking on doors, encouraging people to leave. We're here to beg our citizens to heed this warning. This storm is worse than we've ever seen. The forecast for Idalia is alarming as it tracks through the Gulf of Mexico, tapping into some of the warmest waters on the planet. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. Back on this side of the border, high winds are increasing the fire risk in one of BC's fire hot zones. Tonight, evacuation alerts are expanding for parts of West Kelowna. Over in Yellowknife, meanwhile, some better news. Officials are working on plans to re-enter the city, but pleading for patience. CTV's Bill Fortier has our story. With just hundreds of people remaining in the Northwest Territory's capital, word today the city is one step closer to welcoming everyone home. So now we're on to phase three, which means we've started calling critical uh, staff back. So Yellowknife's mayor water, says that includes sewer. hospital and EMS staff, along with workers at stores and gas stations. Once those services are available, the next phases include bringing the general population back, but fire-related road closures could push that back. You know, we were optimistic, hoping five days, but um, it might take a bit more, particularly with, with the highway conditions now. Since yesterday, the fire, 15 kilometers from the city, has been classified as being held. Still, crews are working on expanding a fire break and dousing hotspots. You need to keep fighting this thing. You need to keep uh, completing work, doing maintenance. Across Great Slave Lake, a different situation in the Hay River area where a raging wildfire is still burning out of control. It's been something to witness uh, the, the amount of effort that's gone into keeping this back from our, our community. In southern BC, lightning last night is believed to have started dozens of new fires. Most of these fires are considered backcountry fires, not threatening any values and burning in extreme terrain. For most of the region, the danger has moved away from communities like West Kelowna. The focus of BC's firefight is now shifting north, where continued drought and heat are in the forecast. And for Northwest Territories evacuees, there's still no concrete answer to that burning question, when can they go home? It's a question Premier Carolyn Cochran will likely face tomorrow as she's set to meet with evacuees here in Edmonton. Vashi. Okay, thanks so much, Bill. The Fed's response to those wildfires Bill reported on led to some controversy today. A climate activist took aim at artwork from a legendary group of seven painter at the National Gallery in Ottawa to protest how the government is handling the fires. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver explains. The polarizing protest didn't last long. It took just seconds to deface the famous Canadian painting Northern River by Tom Thompson. This is one of the a bold move done to highlight the climate crisis. What's worth more, a painting of landscapes or the real landscape? 
The attention-grabbing scheme got this protester, Caleb Sudfeld, arrested and charged with mischief. This is something that we absolutely just need to fight through. So On to Ottawa, the group behind the action at the National Gallery says it will continue disruptions in the capital until the government agrees to train and employ 50,000 firefighters as part of a national firefighting agency. It's a life or death situation. Throwing washable paint at a painting that's covered in glass, is that really so much property damage as to all the properties, homes and lives that have even been destroyed this year? And it's only at 1.3 degrees of warming. Right? Over the last year, climate protesters have hit a number of priceless pieces of art. In June, protesters in Sweden tossed paint at a Claude Monet painting, then glued themselves to the frame. In London, tomato soup was thrown at a Vincent van Gogh painting. No way! And last May, the Louvre's famous Mona Lisa was smeared with cake. It's a problem this museum security consultant says more and more galleries are preparing for. They're not picking uh, second string paintings uh, by, uh, by any, any means. Um, and uh, so there, you know, there is some ability to, to predict that maybe the security needs to be heavier in those galleries. The National Gallery says the painting wasn't damaged as it was behind glass. It's been temporarily taken down for closer inspection, but is expected to be rehung shortly. Vashi. Thanks, Annie. That's Annie Bergeron Oliver outside of the National Gallery in Ottawa. Ontario is exploring returning two properties to the Greenbelt after developers who own the land quietly listed them for sale. Premier Doug Ford insists in a statement at no point was the intention to sell disclosed to the government's facilitator during active and ongoing discussions. The opposition, though, says the Conservatives are changing their tune simply because they got caught. Whether or not he cancels this little sliver of land is really not the point. Uh, he needs to recall the legislature immediately and, and cancel the whole thing. Earlier this month, a searing Auditor General report showed the decision to allow to build on protected Greenbelt land was heavily influenced by well-connected developers. It's hard to miss during any major sporting event lately a barrage of ads for online gambling with celebs doing the promoting. Now Ontario is putting a halt to the practice, announcing a ban on athletes or celebrities appearing in those ads. As CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, advocates want the ban to go even further. Gambling ads like this one featuring NHL star Connor McDavid and Hall of Famer Wayne Gretzky will soon be blocked in Ontario. I think this will provide greater protections uh, to those to Ontarians and particularly um, will ensure that uh, minors aren't subjected to, um, to advertising about internet gambling um, by their heroes. Gaming companies will still run ads. They just won't be able to use athletes, celebrities, or public figures that can appeal to younger Canadians. The only exception is if a role model wants to advocate for responsible gaming, though some experts say this doesn't go far enough. Uh, a growing number of countries are banning ads altogether. Italy, Spain, the Netherlands. Australia is considering uh, a gradual ban of all ads over three or four years. Since single-game sports betting was legalized in 2021, these high-profile promotions have exploded. Addiction and mental health experts warn, with quick bets made over smartphones, problem gambling is also on the rise. A recent survey by the Canadian Centre for Addiction and Mental Health found 42% of adolescents had gambled with money or something of value, and around 10% of teens had bet online. Young people are considered of uh, it's considered impulsive by nature, especially young uh, males, considered impulsive, and uh, they if they start developing uh, gambling habits when during adolescence, they tend to continue those habits throughout their life. The new rules for gambling ads in Ontario won't come into effect until the end of February, a delay many advocates are criticizing. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News. Ottawa. A long deferred decision on the dilapidated 24 Sussex in Ottawa may be taking shape. Senior government sources confirm the Prime Minister's official residence may not be restored. Instead, the procurement department is considering building a new house at a different location. The historic mansion next to the Ottawa River is in desperate need of repairs, pegged at more than $36 million. It was home to a dozen Prime Ministers and has been empty since 2015. Time for a short break tonight, but when we come back, 
Violence towards our community is escalating in the States. A new warning for LGBTQ2S plus Canadians traveling south. Plus, flash floods in Italy force an unlikely rescue mission. There's a new travel warning tonight from Ottawa for 2S LGBTQI plus Canadians heading to the U.S. following big legislative changes at the state level there. CTV's Jill McAshawn reports. Quietly this morning, Canada advised its gay community to be cautious of heading to the United States. A new online advisory warns travelers some states have enacted laws and policies that may affect 2S LGBTQI plus persons check relevant state and local laws. Changes made by professionals, said the Deputy Prime Minister, who monitor for potential dangers. Every Canadian government, very much including our government, needs to put at the centre of everything we do the interests and the safety of every single Canadian. Canada's closest ally and neighbour has seen nearly 500 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced in state legislatures this year. Bills that ban drag performances, restrict education relating to sexual orientation, and limit access to transgender health care for people under 18. It's what prompted an LGBTQ civil rights group in the U.S. to issue its own travel advisory against Florida. For years now, we've been watching as the anti-queer rhetoric has been on the rise, laws are being changed, and, um, and quite frankly, violence towards our community is escalating in the States. The travel advisory applauded by gay rights groups, but there is growing concern Canada's own track record is tarnished as anti-LGBTQ action is impacting more Canadian communities. We're seeing protests around uh, drag story time. We're seeing policies and legislation being introduced by ministries of education. We can't, on one hand, say that, oh, you know, other jurisdictions are all bad when we're doing this here at home. Changes to the travel advisory were not made at a political level, but by the department alone, said a senior government source, and the U.S. Embassy was made aware. The U.S. ambassador to Canada said in a statement, his country stands for equality and equal treatment for all. Jill McIsh on CTV News, Winnipeg. A family is accusing Air Canada of racial discrimination after they were removed from a flight at Montreal's airport. To walk from the, the actual back to all the way to the front was humiliating. I, we were, I felt denigrated at this point. It was a terrible experience. Just before takeoff last month, the Wrights noticed their luggage was still on the tarmac. When they inquired about it, they say the crew escorted the entire family out without any explanation. The airline said in a statement that it will not discuss the details publicly, but will explain the decision if a formal complaint is filed with authorities. The family plans to file racial profiling complaints with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. The new COVID variant has been detected in Canada, though health officials say there is no increased risk to the public. A person in B.C. tested positive for the BA 2.86 variant. The local health authority there says that person had not traveled outside the province recently. Still ahead tonight, an unbelievable discovery in the operating room. The parasite that wormed its way into a patient's brain. Doctors at an Australian hospital got quite a surprise as they tried to get answers to a 64-year-old woman's mysterious illness. During a biopsy, they pulled out a parasitic roundworm from the patient's brain. It was eight centimeters long. I took my tweezers or my tumor holding forceps and I pulled it out and I thought, gosh, what is that? It's moving, take it out of my hands. And we put it in a path pot. Thank goodness. We worked out that this was uh, a new parasite that had never been seen in a human before. The woman had been dealing with depression and forgetfulness prior to the surgery. She's now doing well. The worm is usually found in pythons. Some dramatic video out of northern Italy tonight of a rescue involving sheep and goats. 
The animals were stranded in the middle of a river when the waters around them suddenly rose. Firefighters used specialized equipment normally reserved for alpine rescues to get to the sheep and goats. All of them made it out okay and eventually reunited with their owners. Canada's men's basketball team advanced to the second round of the World Cup in Jakarta. Gilgis Alexander not settling and he banks it in. Shea Gilgis Alexander of the NBA's Oklahoma Thunder led the way with 27 points in a convincing win over Latvia. Canada finished the opening round with three straight wins and play their next game on Friday. After the break, the best players in the world are going to be in one league. History in the making in women's pro hockey. Some of the world's best hockey players now know where they could be playing in the new year. The Professional Women's Hockey League has announced where its first six teams will be based. And while we still don't know what they'll be called or what arenas they're going to play at, we can tell you that three of the chosen cities are in Canada. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Jean-Viev Beauchemin. The league needs a few finishing touches before puck drop. Tic-tac-toe, says Marie-Philippe Poulin. But top talent in women's hockey now officially has a single new league of its own in North America. The journey to get us here has been long, it's been twisted, it's been empowering, but I'm not sure success comes in a straight line. And to replace last season's leagues, the professional women's hockey league, the PWHL, is moving fast. Its original six teams will be in Toronto, Montreal, but also Ottawa and south of the border in New York, Minneapolis, St. Paul's and Boston. The first face-offs are set for this January. Longtime NHL executive Brian Burke is the new executive director of the Players Association. This is the most exciting day in the history of women's hockey. Isbell shoots and scores! <laughs> Samantha Isbell will try out for a spot on the roster. Last season, she was in the lineup for the Montreal Force of the now defunct Premier Hockey Federation. It's the first time in history that the best players in the world are going to be in one league. So uh, I think it's pretty incredible what they've done so far. But now it's time for Montreal. As a young player, Isbell dreamed of an NHL career. But new generations of girls, she says, may now look to the PWHL. Though salaries don't quite match up for now, the PWHL top earners will pocket $80,000. That's nearly 10 times less than the NHL minimum wage. The NHL sent its congratulations, saying it looked forward to working with the new league to, quote, grow our sport. And those three ladies there. Jana Hefford represented Canada on International Ice for 17 years. I'm very excited for the players to be a part of this today. This is what we've been building towards for quite some time, and they're going to have the opportunity to be a part of this special moment. She thanked tennis legends Billie Jean King and Alana Kloss, who've long fought for women in sports and are now on the board of the new league, part of the team pushing for women's hockey to score big where other leagues have failed. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. And that does do it for us tonight. I'm Vashi Capellos in for Omar. For all of us here at CTV National News, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your evening, and I look forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow.